he said, well, I'll call you a couple days later, but I'll need a little time to let it sink in. And then actually, he, uh, I, I was staying at the Panaches. I was, I, was, I was on the front steps, and I got a phone call three minutes after the movie ended. And he said, uh, I want you to know I like the movie very much. And uh, I cried three times, and nobody knows more about Bob Durst than you do, so you know maybe we should get together. That was sort of the beginning of it. Uh, it's a remarkable thing that you taped all those conversations. You got how did you get some of the footage? Like for example, um, there's things, of course, that haven't been seen by this audience yet. But the, the amount of footage that you got, even with capturing the Freedmans, you had the crazy luck of finding the family that had this, you know, uh, remarkable crime story where they actually videotaped their arguments at home, so you actually had tape of things that normally you wouldn't have. In this film, you got access to all sorts of, of film and video. Can you talk about that a little bit, how you got some of that stuff? Yeah, I mean, it obviously changes your perception of somebody dramatically if you go that deeply into their story and you really can go back and see images of what they were like before they became notorious. Um, and in this case, we, because we've been working on this in some weird obsessional way for like eight years at the end of the day when the movie and the, we, um, we, we had met a lot of people who were connected. And even in the Durst family, which has been extremely antagonistic to, to this film, to the prior film, um, and they express their antagonism as billionaire families sometimes do through law firms and, and, um, and letters and documents and depositions. And so uh, they had been so adamant about preventing us to have, uh, from having access to any of the family members. And then I got a Facebook message from a guy who was, who's in, he's a little kid in one of the shots that you see, and he'll become a very important person in, the, in later episodes. Um, and he called and he said, I want to talk to you. I am ashamed of my family. And I have never been able to get over this, and this is something we can't talk about inside my family, but I think the way that we have behaved is wrong, and I think that I want to extend myself in some way. And of course, he was a real uh, nephew of Bob Durst and Kathy, and he had sort of miraculous collection of materials that had gone back. And so some of it is from other sources, but he was really the primary source. I remember when you were making uh, All Good Things, you would sort of half joke that you were always kind of looking over your shoulder because you didn't know Bob Durst was going to kill you. Um, <laughs> then you get to sit down and talk to him. One of the most remarkable things is that even during the process, you were you were incredibly compassionate toward this guy who, in certain moments, seems fucking insane, <laughs> and and who is you, you, he looks pretty guilty, and it's kind of clear what's going on, and yet. What I loved is that you didn't want to pass judgment until you had to. I'm just curious, in the process of actually interviewing him again and again and getting to sort of know him, were you feeling like he might kill you or run? Or what, like, what was his, did you ever feel like you were being played? Like what was your sense of your relationship with Bob Durst in the process? Um, I mean, Nancy, Nancy's sitting here and she has really stuck with this insanity for a long time. And we talked about that at the beginning, and she said, you know, why do you want this person in your life? Um, and I didn't really feel like I had a lot of choice in the matter. You know, I had made that film, I was very engaged in it, I, I cared about the subject, I cared about this girl who went missing, strangely, um, and uh, I was connected to her family, and I thought, you know, Bob Durst is reaching out to me, he has something to say, and it's my job to try to express that. So to, to do that in a way that would have been judgmental, I think would be counterproductive. And I, I didn't really know, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't know um, uh, enough to, to know anything at the time, and, and thankfully uh, Nancy allowed it to, uh, to continue. Uh, one more question, then we'll open it up. The, uh, the process of making this film, or this series, which began as a film, yes? Um, as you were working on this, there were some insane coincidences. Like things happened that, for me, made sense because you were doing it, but were crazy. <laughs> you have to talk about the backpack. Just tell that one that one thing, because it's literally this didn't happen, and yet it happened. It's insane. So um, this is like I get to call JJ and be like, okay, this following thing didn't happen. Um, so we had interviewed Bob the first time mainly what you've just seen is the first interview. And I have to say, the two episodes you've just seen, 
is not that there are four more episodes because we just wanted to like play it out or we were you know um, we weren't tired of it yet the stuff that happens in the next episodes is so radical and unexpected that you kind of go on this thrill ride and then you're just stuck on it and you and, and I, I do have to say like you cannot believe how crazy the story gets like, this, is, <laughs> this is nothing so anyway the, uh, so the the, the, the the weird thing was we had done this interview and Bob had said if you want to do another interview with me uh, it's fine you just call me up anytime I'm an open book and you can you can call me whenever you want and so at a certain point we um, came upon uh, some essential questions that we need to ask there are a few people in the room now who know what kinds of questions they were. I, I won't go into them. Uh, but it became very important to the story that we approach Bob again. And uh, so I called him, and suddenly his enthusiasm for the second interview had changed a little bit. And, you know, he would schedule it and then cancel it, schedule it and cancel it. And that happened a lot, like maybe a dozen times. And it was clear that he just, at a certain point, had decided, you know, he didn't want to do anymore and that it wasn't fun anymore. And the truth is, you know, he has all the money in the world, doesn't need to do this. And obviously, if it didn't entertain him or it didn't suit his needs, he wasn't going to do it. So um, I kind of thought we were in a, in a little trouble in terms of telling the story. And one day he called me up and he said, um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about what you want to do, and I've decided you've done Bob Durst. You need a new gig. And I said, all right, well, thanks for letting me know when my movie's over. But anyway, when can we get together? And, um, and so it looked like that was sort of the end of the line. And I left him alone for a long time. And then, um, you know, not knowing whether he was going to come back and not knowing how it was going to end. And then I get this phone call from this musician in the middle of the night when on my cell phone. And he says, hey, this is Chris. And I'm this musician in LA, and, uh, I, and, and, and I want to know if you want Bob Durst's backpack. And I, I said, uh, I'm sorry, what, I don't know you. And he says, well, I'm friends with your brother Nick, and I'm just this musician guy, and I was in this cafe in Prego in LA, and I was, there's this guy sitting across from me. He left his backpack. And another guy said to me, the old guy left his backpack, and I'm leaving, so maybe you could hold it for him. So do you want it? And I said, well, how do you know I have any connection to it? He says, oh, I opened it up, and in there, there's like a, a printout of an iPhone, and the address book, I opened it, and the first page says Andrew Jarecki, and it was under the A's. And I thought, well, I know Nick Jarecki, so okay, I'll just give, give Andrew Jarecki a call. Numbers right here. So I thought, that, that's the most bizarre. So I, then I thought for the first time, now I'm going to die. <laughs> that's, this is impossible that that is a coincidence. And so I, so I said, can I call you like, in the future? And I, and I hung up, and I waited, and I, I called Nick. And Nick said, no, he's a real guy. He's a nice guy. He's not, he's not part of some international plot. He's just a guy, a musician. And so, uh, so he was in LA at the time. Then I, I, I called him two days later, and he, and he, and he picked up the phone. And he said, can I give you this thing? Because I spoke to my dad, and he just Googled Bob Durst, and he said I should get in my car and drive as far as I can and throw it out of my car. <laughs> and I said, no, I'd be happy to take the backpack from you. You know, um, I guess you're in L.A. He said, no, no, I'm in New York. And I was like, uh, where are you? I live on 66 and, and, and Lexington. And uh, he's, he's, oh, I'm on 72nd and 3rd. And I thought, well, now I'm definitely going to die. Uh, so I said, all right, well, um, I guess I'll come over and get it. And I'll meet you at the VN coffee shop. He's like, okay. So I go over there. He throws it at me, basically. And we say goodbye. And that was my only interaction with him. And I, I go back and I thought, what do I do with this thing? So, you know, and, and I, I glanced at it. There's, you know, Bob smokes a lot of weed. There were some sort of like seeds and stems and a little packet. And there was like the iPhone and a house key, very little. And I thought, I gotta do exactly the right thing now. So I called him and I left him a message and I said, Bob, I just uh, got a phone call from this guy who knows my friend in LA and the thing, and it's a backpack in Prego and you have to, I, I told it exactly the way that it happened. And then I sent him an email a second later, exactly what happened. And I didn't hear from him for like 10 days because he was probably thinking the same thing that I was, which is this is too, this is somebody's playing some kind of game with me. And then finally, um, he called me 10 days later, and he said, thank you for finding my backpack. 
Um, if you could send it to my wife and get that address, then that would be great. And uh, by the way, whatever it is you want to do, I'm ready to do. So there was a sort of a trust thing that was going on, which is a big thing in that relationship. Let's uh, take some questions from the audience. It's a much longer version of that story, <laughs> well, which I'm going to tell you in a second. Questions for Andrew Drake. The man to my left, Andrew Drake, right there. No, not that 